Okay, so it's a party. Yes. But about TV. Yes. Join us every Monday for TV Party, where we'll talk about the news of the moment, the best episodes of the week, and what we can't wait to find sitting on our DVRs. We'll also chat with actors, writers, and experts about TV, elect classic characters to our Hall of Faces, deep dive into full seasons of some great shows, and more. Find us at Consequence of Sound, iTunes, or wherever you procure fine podcasts. Oh, Clint, one more thing. Is it open bar? It's BYO. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with... It's an audio interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Wherever you're listening from today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button before we get started. That means whether you're listening on Spotify, where you get your favorite podcasts... Or even if you're listening on YouTube, you can subscribe there as well. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest is Gregory Allen Isakoff. He's got a brand new record. It's his first in five years called Evening Machines. We'll talk about his life as a farmer between records and how nature inspires his writing. We'll also get into how immigration. He's uh, originally from South Africa, he and his family, and that works its way in a little bit on this record in a song called Birth. And there's also some discussion on him having the closing song on the Netflix show, The Haunting of Hill House, one of my favorites of the year. It's a beautiful record from a really nice guy. It's Kyle Meredith with Gregory Allen Isakov. Oh, hey, Kyle. How's it going, man? Dude, uh, Evening Machines is just one of the most beautiful little creations that I've heard this year. Congratulations on this. Thanks so much, man. I know a little bit of the talk, um, you know, there was five years in between this and the last record, which you had stayed plenty busy, but I, I feel like there's probably some good stories to kind of fall into before we get into the album proper. Uh, one of those involves a flood, right? Yeah, we did have a big flood in, in Boulder uh, where I was living, and that sort of set me kind of just travel. I was doing a lot of opening at that time, opening tours and stuff, running around and kind of just staying with friends for a while, but then I started more full-time farming, you know, and then a little less touring. But yeah, constantly kind of writing, you know, on the on the road and stuff. I've been through those floods. My my house in in two years flooded three times, I think. Oh yeah, so you know. <laughs> I know. No, it, 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 I finally just we just left the house. We just left it there. We're like we're done. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. This is this is it. Yeah. I know how that can kind of uh, uproot your life in, in that sort of way. But but I mean, it sounds like this is one of the things. You, like everybody would ask me, like well, what kind of positive thing can you find out of this? And at the moment, I was just upset that I lost all of my music. But uh, but, but it sounds like you yeah. were able to kind of turn this into something else. Oh, yeah. I, You know, I was I, looking back, I think it's probably one of the coolest things that's happened. I think when you go through like kind of a tragedy like that or, or just kind of a life up, uproaring and uprooting, you know, you kind of are forced to kind of see what's important and simplify, you know. Yeah. So it's been a really good change for me. You had mentioned finally going full time on the farming. That's that's sort of always been part of your story. H- what did that entail, going full time, as you say? You know, I used to play more, tour more in the summertime, and I used to do kind of. Uh, I grew four varieties of seeds for a, like a local heirloom seed company. It was pretty flexible, so I would just grow mainly in the summer season, and then just be gone. You know, I'd set up irrigation, and then kind of come back a few times to kind of check on things and then harvest in the fall. And that was it. And so, you know, the last few years I've been doing kind of more intensive, like market farming with a couple of restaurants and a few markets. Yeah. So still, what, what, are you, what are you farming these days? What kind of, uh, what kind of seeds or vegetables? I'm doing, you know, I do an heirlooms. Well, for the, I still keep kept my account with the seed company. I, I do uh, like an heirloom corn, a blue Chihuahua corn and a yellow bean and a mint, a lemon basil. And then for market, I do a lot of, you know, greens. Um, that's kind of what the chefs want the most. You know, I do a lot of, like, salad turnips and beets, carrots, and then just, uh, like, you know, 12 varieties of, of greens, lettuces and kale and arugula and stuff. Being a farmer, knowing this much about, you know, food and where it comes from, does that affect how you eat on the road? Because it, eating as a touring musician is not an easy thing to do, eating healthy yeah. anyway. You know, I... I love, well, on the West Coast, it depends where we are, you know. 
I have a lot of friends that I know from my horticulture days that have farms on the West Coast, and so I'll go visit them, and we'll bring back a lot of food and have it on the bus or whatever. And then in the winter, you know, it's there. We I do try to go to all the local kind of markets when whenever I can. It's kind of just in a nerdy way, just to see what's going on. Yeah. Another one of the things that kind of happened recently, uh, I am completely obsessed about The Haunting of Hill House. Uh, watched it all yeah, in like know. 24 I hours. I learned about that show. Yeah. Yeah, So, but, but it's your song at the end. And, and I remember, like, I've been aware of you and, and your music for a while now, but I didn't match it up as the song that's playing at the end. But me and my wife were talking about it. I was like, oh, this is a really pretty song. We need to figure out who this is. I turn around to do the research like, wait a second. Oh, cool. <laughs> this is you. This is the song, If I Go, I'm Going. So... So how much? So you didn't have a, a large hand to play in this, I guess. I guess you know I I, I so <laughs> it's embarrassing, but sometimes I get a little unplugged, and I you know I have, luckily I have like an awesome friend that helps me out with managing, and um, we've known each other forever, and whenever I answer my phone, she tells me all these things at once, and then I sometimes forget. <laughs> but I always get so excited about that stuff, you know. I love like doing collaborations television and film and stuff it's like my favorite thing and i'd heard of the show it was sort of but i i haven't seen it you know yeah now this is based on you know one of the greatest books of all time by by shirley jackson of, of the same awesome. name and and um i i i don't know I'm, I'm trying to draw a parallel sometimes when they're not there but i'm going to do it anyway because i like to do so <laughs> but you know i mean there are lots of ghosts in the show uh it it, it all takes place at night for much of it and and i thought oh that just kind of works out perfectly but as as we learned about evening machines i mean this is a record of the night and and not to say that you were haunted by the night but but it sort of plays a big part right yeah a huge part of my writing and and but i guess uh is that like a horror show or something it's it is in a way yeah i mean they're ghosts Uh you know and and the ghosts are it's it's psychological i should say okay gotcha (laughs) Cool. Yeah, but uh, but that but that's what we learned because that's what uh, I mean. How does that play into the title? I, I think I know the story. Evening machines. You know, I uh, I had this title going. You know, a lot of times in a record, I'll have the title before I have the record fully. But I I, I kind of I was just like you know I, when I was just farming and stuff. You know, I I had no time during the day. Plus the the little tiny highway we live on it gets kind of noisy and like in the afternoons and stuff. And so I would always just set up mics at night, and I was like, you know, I'd, we'd be finished a long day of, of farming and growing and whatever we're doing, harvesting or washing or whatever. And like, I'm going to go play with my evening machines. <laughs> you know, it's just like, say it kind of funny like that. And I don't know, it just kind of stuck, you know. Um, you know, we kind of le- left all the gear on all the time. So we kind of, it was always just kind of this like little orange glow coming in the back of the barn, you know, 24 7. And so it kinda, that kind of just stuck. Uh, but I love how, you know, you, you find those little trails all the way through the album. I mean, uh, easy one to pull out is Dark, Dark, Dark. It has the word in the title there. But uh, but even with songs like Caves, where you talk about, you know, it let's let the stars do their talking and, and yeah. later on Wings and All Black, you know, those bright crooked yeah. stars, man, they're howling out. Like, do you, do you find that that's seeping into you like more than, or, or I should say somewhat thematically? It does. You know, I think as writers, we kind of get into these obsessions. And I've been through so many different ones, but I, I think, yeah, for some reason, that was kind of one of my obsessions. Yeah. What do you think draws you there? I mean, other than it's just, you know, what you're surrounded by. You know, I don't know. Um, a lot of the landscape makes it into the writing, and I think a lot of, you know, where we've been and what we've gone through get makes it in there. But I don't know if I've ever honestly sat down and thought, man, I'm I'm going through this period of time. I, I need to write a song about this. or I don't, I don't really have that as part of my process. I start from nothing, and then it, things sort of happen in this kind of cool, hard to explain kind of way. And then you kind of just follow it, and you just hold on, and you try to, you just try to hope it, you get to the end, you know. <laughs> so kind of it. Well, as that might be a bit more abstract, a song like "Birth." Does it, it, it does this talk about immigration? Does this sync up with what what is happening uh, in the news right now? It happened too. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't intentional again at all. The song sort of happened. Um, I did like kind of like an all night sesh with my little brother, and we were kind of he's one of my favorite writers too. And we kind of were just um, set up, and I had this little melody in the back pocket, this little crooked kind of whirly Wurlitzer part. And uh, we just kind of split off and started writing like you know a ton of verses. And then we recorded it all that night, 
and and the, the original song was you know like almost 20 minutes long wow. and then we kind of listened to it because we wanted to include everything because you know we didn't want to miss out on anything that was going to help it and then we just kept cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and then you know uh, i think a, a few weeks later we were like holy shit this is like it this is totally an immigration song like we had no idea because the characters in the song you know is this um kind of statue this liberty statue and um one of the main characters in the song and 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 the other character is sort of like this angel kind of person you know maybe from another time that's kind of landing here like kind of like an immigrant landing here and and you know my brother and I are both immigrants we grew up with a ton of other kids that were immigrants in our building and that was and then you know with with everything going on now I mean it seemed to line up like that way and I, we didn't plan for that at all. It's beautiful when that happens, but yeah. As you d- does that affect you when, when you hear about you know what's going on in the news? I mean, specifically, of course, you know, there's uh, migrants you know marching through Central America right now, uh, and, and that seems to be taking the spotlight. But there's no shortage of these stories out there by any means. No. no, and it's it's heartbreaking, and I think you know it's going on all over the place, all over the world, and it seems like that's the hip thing. Everyone's just being, you know, it seems like this collective cycle that's happening right now. And it's really coming to the surface because, you know, when I was in Europe, it was going on in England and France and Italy and even Scandinavian countries where it's just hard for people, you know, people were getting kicked out of the countries and, you know, or the, the, that sort of conversation was happening in the media everywhere, you know, and it really just based in, it was really based in, in racism, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. You can really just feel that. And I grew up in apartheid. I know what that's like. Yeah. So it's like we're, we're not as, as in the future as I, th- I was hoping. <laughs> I think a lot of us got that rug pulled out from under us, you know, that everything was on the upswing in that way. And then because, yeah. you know, it's, it's I don't know, I'm not saying anything that has been said before. And uh, but, you know, it's it's those imaginary lines we draw that suddenly are supposed to separate people that are just people. And it's right. it's, it's warped is what it is. It's completely it's just, warped. Yeah, it, was really, it was really scary, actually, you know, because just like, who are they going to point out next? OK, it's going to be you. It might be you. Right. It might be you. Right. You know, <laughs> it's a scary, weird, bizarre time. Yeah, well, especially to have that background, you know, a, a lot of us can can feel for people, but uh you know, you, you've got that real uh, that empathy there, and it's um, and I, I do love how it's come out in this song. You know, even subconsciously, anyway. It's uh, yeah, yeah. You know, for me, the the content or the storyline of the songs, sort of, I love that stuff. You know, I love piecing together stories, and and and, and I might do it in a little bit of a bizarre way, but I, my favorite thing about it, I mean, the most important thing to me really is, is if the song feels universal, you know, mm-hmm. and people can really connect to it. And so whether you're, you know, an immigrant or not or whatever, we all know what it's like to just kind of keep moving forward and, and not spend too much time looking in the past, you know. That was really the the meat for me where I was like, okay, yeah, this makes me feel something. And then to move further down the record, Caves is probably an instant favorite. I mean, but it's, it's almost a completely different feeling on this song. I mean, this is a big song on a... Yeah, you know, on a hushed record, I guess. A lot of the songs, you know, and even some of them that I didn't have time, or I, the record wasn't long enough to keep to keep some of them on, but a lot of them were really dark and dirty and uh, kind of ugly, which felt right. A lot of the production, I, you know, I really, you know, a lot of these songs weren't weren't feeling like uh, sweet or, uh, you know, I, I was really moving away from just feeling precious about anything, but but really, um, some of the songs are, are uncomfortable. Some of the production is un- uh, uncomfortable, you know. For that particular song, we had like, oh, I think there was like 12 of us <laughs> or 13 of us just singing every word of that song in, in the bar, just like into a couple mics. And when I'd done the, when I played the drums, I kind of crushed them really hard with some compressors. And, and when I ended up mixing that with, with Tucker in Portland, he really knew what I was after. And he, the the gear that, that he was using was like kind of, I had like a model of that gear, of that piece of gear for, for that compressor. It was called a devil lock. And he had that actual piece of gear. Like it was amazing. I was like, Oh, I've never actually seen one of these. This is so cool. And, and it was just right there on his desk. Like he uses it all the time. That's a favorite of mine on that record too. Uh, oh, thanks. I mean, there's a lot of great moments on this, and again, I congratulate you. Uh, w- when you talk about, you know, some of the cut stuff, you know, a 20-minute version of Birth, do, do you ever think that version will see the light of day? Man, you should see my house. It's just covered in songs, and my my priority was to try to get to the bottom of this record because 
I had recorded over 35 songs and a lot of them, you know, I really, I really loved how they came out, but they just didn't sequence right. You know, there was never a, a time where I was like, I'm ready to hear that now, you know? And so I, I realized like certain songs just want to live together and other songs want to live together. So we, we kind of have another kind of record that's, um, I wouldn't say by and at any means finished or anything, but pretty, pretty flushed out, which is exciting. So uh, some other stuff that, that, you know, didn't make it. So, yeah. Yeah. So it might not be another five years before the next one. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's funny that my friend, I was talking to my friend Patrick Park and he was, uh, he's just coming out with a record and I was like, Oh yeah. How long was it since you put your last one? He's like about five years. I was like, that seems like the amount of time it takes, huh? He's like, yeah, for me. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I don't know who decided it should be shorter than that. But I think if you really care about what, what this process, and I think for me, the way, the time away from it to, to kind of investigate it and to, uh, for rewrites and all that sort of thing, seems like that seems like uh, three to five years seems like the time frame. Well, as a fan, when you, when you fall in love with a piece of music, you just want more of that music. That's, that's what it comes <laughs> down so to. Cool. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my one of my biggest heroes in that kind of when I was growing up, and I was like, "Oh, is that okay? Is that is that?" Because you know, it's always been a few years between records for me. Mm-hmm. And it was Gillian Welch and mm-hmm. David Rawlings, and they, you know, I think it was like every five years or so there was a new record, and I was like, "That is so awesome! Like that's so brave." Because in this, you know, in the music world, it's like, "Oh, you're going to become everyone's going to forget, and you're going to have to start over," and, you know. But for me, I, I don't know. I've always been kind of satisfied where we're at as a band, I guess. The shows that we're playing and all that stuff. And I just really, really just want to make something that kind of hopefully will live, you know. Yeah, we appreciate it. And again, it's all evident on the Evening Machines. Uh, it's a really beautiful record, Gregory, and uh, I thank you for it. And I thank you for taking the time to talk today about it, too, man. I appreciate it. I really it. appreciate it, too, man. Thank you so much. All right. We will see you around somewhere on the road. Awesome. <laughs> All right, man. Take care. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. My thanks to Gregory Allen Isaacoff for that call right there. The new record is called Evening Machines. It's available now. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button before you get out of here, whether you're listening on YouTube, uh, on Spotify, or uh, wherever you get your favorite podcasts from. After that, you can head to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show every Monday through Thursday from noon to 3 Eastern. You can also find some bonus episodes of this series over there. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.